Okay, thanks for introducing me, Alita. So yeah, I think like this is a start of like a whole array of presentations coming next, and I'll try to introduce them as best as possible. So I'm trying to monitor seismic attenuation using train-induced noise, and the motivation behind this project was like Illinois Geological Survey was really interested whether we can use uh, ambient noise to monitor the subsurface and their temporal changes, like how it is changing, the water level is changing there, or other properties. So that uh, brings me to the motivation of this, uh, sorry, the background of this project was like, uh, what are the different ambient noise sources are there and how they have been, uh, have been used uh, before. So uh, like uh, we have, uh, researchers have used different ambient noise sources like human footsteps, motor vehicles and trains. And they have done an array of research uh, monitoring the above ground activities like urban running activity, traffic flow monitoring during COVID, and also below the subsurface, uh, like below the surface, like uh, near surface zero velocity estimation, attenuation measurement, then subsurface imaging and tectonic tremor detection. And in our study area in Illinois, you will find like um, some of those sources with some additional sources that uh, we are most interested in. So uh, there are two groups of wind turbines here, uh, uh, um, here in the Hoopstone wind farm and the Pioneer Trail wind farm. And uh, uh, Fong is going to talk about more in details, like how many wind turbines are there in these two groups. And we deployed several nodes in there. So there are two uh, nodes uh, that have been not been shown here, uh, deployed right below the wind turbines here, and one node uh, inside this groove here. And uh, Fong and uh, Alejandro will talk about uh, the details of these nodes and how it can be used to monitor uh, vibrations generated by wind turbine and the track, uh, the road, uh, like the traffic going on this road. And I'll be focusing mostly, uh, sorry, before that, uh, there is another road here, uh, which is Illinois 49, a major road. And there is a node uh, right beside that. And Alexa will talk about like, how can we detect uh, vibrations from the traffic in this road using that node. And I'll be focusing on actually like the vibrations generated by the train going on the, in this on this track. And uh, like that's recorded by this uh, seven nodes here. And how can we use that uh, vibration uh, to analyze the subsurface changes? And first of that, because I'm using train-induced vibration, so first, uh, the thing that I need to detect is basically the train arrivals. Like we are measuring a whole array of uh, noises. How can we detect the train arrivals, uh, separate that from traffic and other uh, noises from there? And I'm using the, I'm gonna use the spectrogram uh, uh, from this uh, sensor one, which is closest to the uh, train track. So first thing uh, is like, how can we detect the train-induced vibration? So this is a spectrogram uh, from the sensor one. You can see here uh, in the x-axis, we have the frequency, y-axis, the time in UTC, and uh, the color is basically the amplitude in decibel. And you see some signatures actually there uh, generated by different sources. The first one is uh, the continuous one uh, that generated continuously in time is actually coming from the wind turbines. Uh, we have uh, vibrations generated by the land vehicles, uh, the cars. And there are like these ones, uh, which are a bit broader, uh, like than the surfer spikier ones done by uh, the vehicles, uh, which are generated by the trains. And the way we select the train induced vibration is actually summing over, uh, like uh, we generated 1D spectrum, summing over uh, between 1 to 20 hertz and 20 to 40 hertz, and then set out a uh, cutoff amplitude and few other parameters. And that's helped us uh, to detect the train arrivals. The thing the most important is like, we are relying on the signature of the trains to detect but whether they are generated by the trains or how they look like, uh, can we do a validation study? So this is a, one of the validation study, like the only validation study we did, uh, we recorded a train arrival. So you can see in this picture, the train is very short. And in the uh, seismogram, you see that like uh, the duration of the, like the blobby spike is only like around 30 seconds. And this is basically the signature of that spike year ones. So you see something like a triangle here, you will see more details in that, how it's, uh, closely related to the traffic uh, when Alexa will talk about that. And we also see some Doppler effect, which was pretty amazing. Now, the thing is that like, it was just a fun for me to try to see whether uh, like we won't have vibration, uh, sorry, the video of the train's arrivals always. So can we use the vibration uh, to detect or to verify the other arrivals that we have the follow uh, field experiment? So I just uh, kind of converted the vibration Here's some sound and actually 
probably see uh, here some Doppler effect. It's very hard. It feels like an airplane if you have heard it before. Um, so that's how actually you can verify uh, from the other train arrivals whether they actually really are the train arrivals or not. But what I will show is basically just the spectrogram and the size, uh, seismogram of this one of the train arrivals and whether they look uh, closer to the, uh, the validation study or not. So this is a much more longer uh, train arrival or like a uh, longer train. And that's why I haven't uh, showed uh, the audio for this one. And you can see in the spectrogram that like, uh, though they look very similar, it's very longer in time. Now, depending on that validation study, so then you can see that like uh, whatever we have detected is actually the train arrivals. So on the basis of that, we uh, detected all the train arrivals for one year. And on an average, we have eight trains uh, per day. And that's actually going to help us to get a robust estimation of whatever we are trying to estimate because we need more uh, train arrivals per day uh, to get a more better fit of data. So next thing is uh, because we are uh, we are trying to measure the attenuation. Uh, so what are the way we are going to measure the attenuation? So we are using the spectral ratio method for that. Uh, so uh, for that, we if this is a two sensor approach uh, coming forward are like one sensor approach, but I'm going to use a data recorded by two sensor combinations. So the first sensor is closest to the source where the sensor two is farthest and has a spacing of S. And because you can, uh, the sensor one is closest to the source, you see that it has a higher amplitude in the seismogram and in the, uh, in the spectrum uh, than the sensor two. And this is a uh, simple like taking a logarithm of the amplitude ratio and dividing it by uh, the spacing. And uh, then we are gonna set a linear equation on the basis of that. And uh, this slow parameter look at that going forward, it will be very important uh, because that's gonna give us uh, the quality factor which is like of uh, inverse of that innovation. And uh, if is our frequency band of interest, and uh, specifically for uh, the rock physicists in, at, uh, in, in this room, that we are making some very simplistic assumptions. So we are with that, uh, we're assuming that V is specifically homogeneous and non-dispersive. Specifically, we'll see that going forward, uh, I have chosen a very small band of frequency. So in that, it makes uh, more sense uh, to uh, estimate a non-dispersive. And then Q is also specifically homogeneous and constant with the small frequency range that we are choosing. So for choosing the frequency range, we also did some analysis to try to see what are gonna be the most feasible range of frequency that uh, we can use to analyze our data. So here I have plotted uh, one of the train arrivals uh, between one to three hertz. And uh, if you look closely here uh, in this range, uh, one to three hertz, you can see that uh, the first sensor, which is closest to the train has higher amplitude than the last sensor here. But if you look at this region, uh, uh, like uh, after 2.5 hertz, uh, you see that like at the further uh, stresses, you see some uh, spiky hertz uh, arrival, which can't be from the train because we don't have that much high amplitude because it's farthest from the train. And the going uh, like in the next slide, we'll see that the what are the sources of this uh, spikier signatures uh, after 2.5 hertz. So this is the spectrogram of the node closest to the train and the farthest to the train, and. Here, uh, for the closest one, you see a signature at uh, 2.07 hertz. Actually, it's generated by uh, the wind turbine group uh, on the right-hand side, or on the east-hand side of the, uh, uh, of the wind turbine group. And that's uh, going uh, in the same direction as the train. Like, it's, uh, it's closest to the train, and it's going to be uh, decaying on the farthest uh, trace. But in this uh, node, which is uh, farthest from the train, we have a spikier signature around 2.7 hertz. It's actually generated by the other group of the wind turbines, and it's more uh, strong because it has more wind turbines there. So we can't actually take this signature because it's going to propagate to the opposite direction of the train arrival, and it's going to totally uh, like give us a wrong estimation of the attenuation because it's propagating the opposite. So depending on that analysis, we chose a frequency band of 1 to 2.5 hertz to do our analysis. And here in this one, you see uh, attenuation measurement for one day. How did we do that? So there are like the dots shows uh, all the combinations of the sensors and the train arrivals. And we have almost like 70,000 uh, points uh, for one day. And we fitted a line through that and measured the slope. And using a velocity of 556 meter per second, uh, we measured a Q factor per day. So this is what is basically the one over Q for the whole year. And uh, it looks very spiky, it's high frequency. So this is basically the raw measured attenuation. We can still see some uh, seasonal changes in there. And uh, in the next slide, uh, starting from the next slide, uh, 
first uh, we'll uh, uh, we'll see like whether it makes sense or not that attenuation. So first thing is that just to uh, make sense of the attenuation measurement, whether the values make sense or not. I just compared it with some uh, attenuation measurement that uh, um, our group did in Singapore. So there, the depth of the investigation of the sensitivity was approximately six uh, six meter. And you can see that the Q values are, oh, sorry, the Q inverse values are one order higher than uh, the attenuation measurement in Illinois. It's basically because uh, our frequency band is so narrow and so small, the depth of investigation is approximately 90 meter. So the Q factor will be way, uh, sorry, the inverse of the Q will be way smaller than what is in Singapore. And next, as I said that like, again, we are trying to validate our attenuation measurement because uh, uh, maybe uh, what we are seeing sometimes it could be just noise. So uh, what we did is basically using uh, the, the data measured by this uh, node in this uh, pine neutral wind turbine group, uh, Elita and Pong did some analysis using normalized photocorelogram and uh, taking the primary reflection uh, from different components. Uh, they averaged the data uh, from the different components and measured the P and S wave amplitude. And first I'm gonna compare the attenuation with the S wave amplitude. Here you can see that uh, the attenuation actually follows the S wave amplitude very well. And it's not surprising because the value of attenuation is predominantly shear wave. So it makes sense that it follows the shear wave amplitude uh, closely. But when we compare it uh, with the P wave amplitude, uh, it only matches uh, the trend uh, in this range between uh, November 2022 to April 2023 20, uh, and the other ranges, it's basically just uh, have a anti-correlation. Now let's see, uh, I talked about like the ways we measured attenuation and uh, tried to validate that. But uh, as in the starting uh, in, the, in the first session, Professor uh, Pong was talking about what the environmental factors that could affect the viscoelastic property of the soil. So this is actually like closely related to that. So we tried to compare attenuation first with the groundwater level, because that's what people are mostly interested in trying to see uh, like the changes in the del V over V, uh, try to measure the groundwater level. We are trying to use that attenuation to measure the groundwater level. Now, first, uh, we compared the groundwater level with the PU amplitude. And if you just look at the long-term trend here, so the, uh, the groundwater level is in the blue uh, line. And the long-term trend matches that uh, the PU amplitude very well. But when we try to compare the attenuation uh, with the groundwater level, it's hardly there is any correlation. Actually, there is anti-correlation in most of the places you can see. Now, uh, we can talk about the reasons behind that, what we guess, like why the groundwater level uh, is not affecting the attenuation a lot. Uh, but I'll go forward with uh, the analysis with the temperature because Professor Fong also talked about uh, the viscoelastic property could be affected by the, the changes in the environmental temperature. And I'll take it uh, by parts, uh, like the things that we see here. So the first is in between this range, where we see a very good correlation with temperature changes with uh, the attenuation uh, when the temperature is below 10 C. Now, if we go above 10 C, uh, surprisingly, there is an anti-correlation between temperature and attenuation. But the slope of the attenuation is actually same. It's just going in the opposite direction. So the slope, this slope is exactly same as this slope, what we have measured. And when uh, the attenuation is uh, not varying too much, when the temperature is also being very constant in these two regions. So that brings uh, to our like uh, intermediate conclusion that uh, the train induced vibration can be used to measure attenuation in a long stretch that we have shown. Now the important factor is like attenuation probably is not a factor of groundwater only. Specifically when the, the groundwater level is not at the very shallow level. So it's, uh, it's not saturating the soil uh, that lot. Uh, it could be affected by the environmental factors uh, like other environmental factors like temperature changes specifically uh, the freezing condition we have in Illinois, and also from soil moisture uh, uh, getting affected by the wind. And uh, future work is like, I'm still working on that, trying to understand uh, the exact correlation between that innovation and other environmental factors, and uh, like how can we explain the changes in that innovation there in Illinois. And also uh, because uh, like the next rock, starting on the next rock, we'll see like there will be uh, current induced vibration measurement, so I'll try to compare my train induced uh, uh, like attenuation measurement with the car induced uh, vibration, like the attenuation measurement for car induced vibration and try to see how it is, how they are correlated or how the high frequency measure compares with uh, the low frequency measures. And that's all from this presentation.